Good morning. Thanks to Axe the Expert. Thanks. Thanks for coming to Axe the Expert episode eight with Marty Rowe, Workbench Coffee. Today we're going to discuss refurbing a machine and then have a panel discussion with Kurt Benedict from Last Man Coffee and discuss our different methods of working on equipment, how to refurb it, and best practices. Marty, why don't you tell us about yourself before we get started? Hello, Highland. First of all, I want to I want to thank you guys for number one doing this this series that you've done. It's been it's been highly educational. It's been a lot of fun listening to it, um, and I'm I'm positive that it's helped a lot of people. and And I feel honored to uh, to be asked to be a part of it. Um, it's pretty great. I'm I'm Marty Rowe. Uh, I've been in the coffee since so oh, just about the late '90s. Um, I fell in love with it, and uh, I was born with a crescent wrench in my hand. And so once I got interested in the coffee scene and realized um, all the cool things that were going on out there, that uh, that I was going to be um, turning the wrenches in the in the coffee industry. I I, I knew that early on, and uh, so that we uh, opened up Service Call, um, our service company, in 2003. Um, have been doing that ever since, and we subsequently, uh, a little after that, we opened up uh, Workbench Coffee Labs, which is a full-service training lab for all your barista skills, uh, Q-grader, roasting skills, uh, all those pathways um, that the S SCAA, back in, back in the day, if you remember the SCAA before the, we lost our A, um, <laughs> uh, all of that um but what we're doing what i'm kind of excited about is uh in uh 2021 this year coming up uh workbench coffee labs will no longer be a full service uh, training facility in other words we're not going to be spread out um, doing all the barista skills stuff and the roasting stuff although we've got associates that can still if people contact us we'll send them their way um, but Workbench Coffee Labs, as a as a company, is going to focus on let's get technicians that turn wrenches that keep the coffee industry percolating, if you will. Uh, let's train them um, in partnership with the Technicians Guild um, to get get this information out and get get guys and gals that are interested in going the same path that I did back starting in the late 90s, um, you know, off on the right foot. So that's what we're going to do. I'll roll that out and get get some curriculum put together. Um, ben and and the AST uh, people uh, and the everyone that's been building content for that has been working real hard in the last couple of years to to get some good stuff out. We've been working hard to have our own curriculum for some other spin out classes. Um, so excited about that. So that's that's a little bit about me. That's where we're that's where we're heading. That's what we're doing. That's very, very cool. So me and Kurt are going to jump off here and okay. give us give me a holler when you need me to change the slide. Awesome. And I hope you don't go too far, uh, Kurt and, and Highland, both of you. Stay in the sides. Uh, I, I I present best if someone's ha hassling me. Um, oh, we'll hassle you. Don't uh, worry. Yeah, yeah. That's so why it's a panel feel free, absolutely. Um, okay. Feel free to uh, put your two cents worth in if you've got a little illustration or a comment or if you disagree with me. I'm okay with that, too. You got it, my man. Why don't you get started? Thank you. All righty. Well, thanks, everyone. I don't know how many people's out there. The thousands and thousands of people, I'm sure. Um, really appreciate you being being with us today. Uh, Highland asked me to uh, put together a, a program um, to deal with refurbishing equipment. Uh, refurbishing um, probably espresso machines is probably what we're going to deal with. And I think that was his intention. So. Uh, I don't know if you know me, but uh, we got to start off by not just jumping right in. But I don't want to be negative. But Highland, if you'll if you'll get that next screen, I I don't want to tell you what refurbishing is. I want you to uh, understand what it's not. Um, any of you that are out there already in the field, I know you've you've walked in on a service call on a machine that someone bought offline and they said, I don't know what's wrong with this. It's just been refurbished by somebody over in you know, wherever. And you find out what what they did wasn't really refurbished. So I want to spend just a, a second or two on on kind of kind of defining a little bit um, 
what we mean by refurb. Um, it's not gaskets and screens and screws. And what, what I mean by that is it's not your normal, if a machine comes in or if you go address something and you tune it up, that's not refurbishing it. Um, it's, that's tuning it up. That's the stuff that it needs uh, all the time anyway. Um, and it's also, if, a, if, you, if you were to buy a machine and wanna flip it, which is, you know, that's a good thing. Um, it's not fixing what's broke and then getting it back out there. You can't call that refurbished either. Um, and I, I got, I've got to confess, when we first started into our, our business and were uh, wanting to flip machines, and we, we would run across a machine that seemed like a decent machine, we'd clean it up. We honestly weren't trying to do anything wrong. We fixed what was obviously broke, what we knew was wrong, cleaned it up, and we might have used the word refurbished. They might have assumed that. Um, but what we what we found was that we were putting machines out there that a month or two later they were having a problem that we didn't address. We didn't we didn't dig deep enough. Um, so I would throw that in a category of not refurbished either. Um, we we weren't trying to do anything wrong. Um, we weren't trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. We just we're just you know doing what we do and fixing what we knew was was wrong um, but there were some things underlying things that we didn't dig deep enough to discover um, so um, and it's not you know cleaning it up and throwing a fresh coat of paint on it either it's you know just because it looks good um, so really um, if you're going to use the term refurb you need to you don't have to replace every part. You don't have to um, put everything new on it, but you have to lift every, no stone unturned as I would call it. You have to visually somehow test or verify that every component, whether it's a tube, part of the hydraulic system or a switch, um, a relay on the board, you've got to know the expected life expectancy that it's still got left in it. Um, um, just because a uh, machine's flowing today, it may be 95% clogged up and you get it back out in the field and things migrate and then it's clogged up and you dig on deeper and you find out that, well, it wasn't, uh, we didn't dig deep enough. So, so I would like to say that it is, I'm going to just read this, an inspection, cleaning, and or replacing as needed of every component to ensure it is either new or works like new with near new life expectancy left in each component. Um, so you have some sort of uh, educated base on how to describe the condition of that machine. Uh, like I said, you don't have to replace every part, um, but if you're going to flip it and you're gonna sell this machine or put it in use, uh, if you know that the uh, uh, the main brain or the relays on that brain are 15 years old it's still working you may choose not to replace that but you're not going to sell that as you're going to want to disclose that um, and and uh, be knowledgeable that 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 component is working but we didn't change that anyway so that's that's my point is it's more comprehensive it's more overall um, look into what the machine is capable of doing and performing for the foreseeable future. Okay, Highland, let's go to that next slide. And you guys are being awful quiet um, over there, Highland and Kurt. Um, well, I, have, I, I, I do have questions, but I wanted to. I want. I want to make sure I'm not okay. pre-asking pre them. So okay. I'll, I'll no, get you're, you're, you're welcome to you. Whatever, whatever works for you. Okay, first things first, if you're going to tie into to spending some time and some love into to a machine, is it, is it worth the effort? Um, what's, what's the end game, in other words? Um, and it, it may be different for different people in different applications. If you're selling it, that's probably the toughest one because monetarily, um, if you're going to lose money, it's not worth doing it. Um, uh, so you, you need to at least break even or, uh, or ideally make a profit on it if that's your goal if you're going to to take this machine clean it up and sell it 
um, if you're using it, you can probably invest a little more time and money into it um, and utilize that that equity um, and and forgive you know the the potential profits back to yourself. That's a way of explaining it um, because you're the end user. Um, or if, if you're doing that for a customer, they may see more value in rebuilding it because they're using it. They're not trying to sell it. Um, but don't disclose or, or discount, I should say. Um, there's items out there. We're seeing, we've been in the industry enough now where there's some, uh, call them heirlooms, call them um, sentimental value. I was talking to a guy not long ago that he had a machine that really wasn't worth rebuilding. but together between he and I, it's getting totally rebuilt and it's it's gonna have way more money into it than what it, what it would ever be worth on the market. But it was his dad's machine that he opened his first coffee shop with. And so it's sentimental value has a lot to do with that too. So do you have a process or a checklist that you use for your tax? I mean, when, when you're sitting down and evaluating a machine, what do you what key what what key points do you look at other than oh, other than uh, well the first thing the first thing i probably would do is the the ten thousand feet overview um i would look at at what would this machine be worth if we were to fix it up and so ebay um uh, online, other technicians, other companies out there, uh, associates that you might be in contact with, um, are a good resource to find out what would this machine be worth in its best possible condition. So that that's your 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 baseline, um, and then you start evaluating the machine itself to find out what does it need, what does it not need, is, does it take sweat equity or does it take actually uh, a cost, hard cost of components um, to get it to that shape that you're wanting to get it to. Um, and then just balance that out. Does that make sense, Tyler? Yeah, and are, now are there, different, are there different considerations when you do a refurb that you're gonna be reselling or when you do a refurb for a customer like the gentleman you're doing the refurb for? Really, really good question. Um, because if here's our deal, after going through the first few months of putting machines out, really wanting to back them up and then having to do some repairs on our own dime because we do back them up. Um, we, that evaluation process that you're talking about changed for us. Um, we, we made the decision that if we are flipping a machine, if we're buying a machine, we're cleaning it up and we're going to sell it to a customer that has the intention of using this for a long foreseeable future, we're no longer just getting it running. We we will take a machine and I don't care how good it looks. It's getting torn down far enough that we can inspect every component, every tube, every every aspect of it. So that that has changed over the years that we've gone further into that. Now on the flip side, you ask about if it's for a customer. It's just like if you've got a, a an old car and it needs brakes on it and you take it to a uh, mechanic to get it worked on and he puts the brakes on it, but also rebuilt the engine and transmission while it was in, because it kind of needed it, uh, you're not gonna be happy. So, so we do respect our customers right. um, with what they need, but we have that open discussion on, if we see something that, that if it was our machine we would do, we absolutely tell them that, that we, we inform them on what the condition is and let them make that decision. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. And we'll sure, open it up. Um, which we kind of got into that. So, so if once you've determined that this is a, a, a venture that you want to get into, that you want to uh, to actually tie into refurbing to whatever degree this machine, um, do your research. Um, look for any documentation that you can have that the manufacturer would have or other technicians that have gone down your path that you're about to go into would have that you can collect. Um, the internet is a, is a great, uh, resource for that. Manufacturers have gotten a lot better over the years. They didn't used to be very good, but they've gotten a lot better over the years of supporting um, uh, schematics, um, parts diagrams. Um, so look for the history of parts availability. You don't have to buy. We do tend to lean towards 
factory parts. If it's a La Marsoco, we, we talk to La Marsoco. Not everyone's got those connections and not every component do you have to buy from the manufacturer. Like a, a liquid level control board um, on an EE La Marsoco, I'm picking on them. Um, that guy car control um, that they sell, you could buy from any aftermarket espresso machine and it's the exact same part. Well, um, so do your research. Let me jump in here. That's actually a good question is when you're doing a refurb, do you focus on OEM parts, which can tend to be more expensive, or do you focus on the right part? Does that make sense? Does the question make sense? It, it does. And that's kind of what I was alluding to is that um, a lot of times the OEM is the actually made by others. Um, that is, is the right part even sourced by someone else. Um, there are proprietary components. Um, I will say this, and we'll kind of get into it a little bit further. The, as, as a technician and as someone that's refurbing a piece of equipment, the further you get away from the material and the design of that original machine, the more liability you're, in essence, assuming. Um, because that machine typically uh, has been tested, either UL or NSF. Somebody has certified that that design and those materials are safe for the public to, to have. And it's not to say that you can't make some modifications. It's not to say that you have to use the exact parts. But you are, you are stepping into um, a, a world where you have fewer people that will stand behind you if something did go wrong. Um, uh, back, back on that, on your plan of attack, just to get kind of back on track here. Um, look for showstoppers. Uh, if, and it kind of goes along with the evaluate and dissect your evaluation. What I mean by that is if you're going to just get the machine running, fix what's broke, you need to really test everything. You need to go through and make sure that everything's working or, or if it's not, what the approach would be to, to attack it. But if you're going to do a total refurb, you know that you're, you're going to change the safety valve. You know you're going to change the pump. You know you're going to, there's a whole list of components that you know you're going to change. For us, that means all of the switches across the front, those are going to go. So there's no sense in spending time on that. Just, just pull those apart. But you don't want to just take a machine in off the street, start disassembling it, and then do your, your testing once you get a lot of hours and a lot of money in it, only to find out there's a crack in the boiler or heat exchangers um, busted. And now you're looking at a you know $1,500 boiler exchange that you didn't count on. So dissect your evaluation. Don't worry about the components you know you're going to toss out or recycle, but do test and, and prove that the components that you're going to utilize at the end of the game, um, that, that they are intact and that they're refurbable. That they're they're good, um, and then my last statement on this this screen would be document document document. Um, you're not going to find every um, schematic for everything that's out there, and not every schematic is going to be accurate. There's going to be modifications. Every every manufacturer out there is really bad about um, throughout the the manufacturing of these pieces of equipment to change things without really letting anyone know. Um, and so you'll see where they've made modifications at the factory that aren't reflected in the documentation that you've got. Um, so I, I found a great, great tool is, is your smartphone. Um, cameras have gotten awesome. Um, you cannot take too many pictures. Um, Pictures, they say pictures worth a thousand words. Absolutely. Um, don't don't allow the pictures to ruin your thought process in knowing how the machine works. In other words, oh, the blue wire goes here. I don't know what the blue wire does. I think you should still know what the blue wire does. But that that having that documentation, when you when you have six wires that have now popped off and you don't know where any of them go, those pictures are, are really worth a thousand words. They really are. So do you have a process that your techs need to go through a series of, for 
for documenting like in the past my text because I you know text Tom's not going out into the field today and he's working on a machine that Bob worked on yesterday. So how do you how do your text know who did what? That that's that's really good too. If you've got more than one person or even if you're you're working on it yourself and you're documenting it, what we try to do, and I, I have to admit sometimes machines get in that don't get this, but we try to build a file um, for these photos to go into. Um, also you know how the I got this from um, visiting someone at the hospital. There's a chart that's at the foot of the bed that the doctor comes in and reads. There's a daily log that we we have for each piece of equipment, and that's that's good. Um, whether you're rebuilding it in a shop where you've got other technicians, or whether you're rebuilding this at home, if you do a daily log of what you've done, um, noting any anomalies that you ran across, or or maybe you discover something that you need to do some future research on those that that little and it's just a notebook it's just a just a a, a clipboard um, right. with some paper on it that's that's pretty simple and pretty straightforward yeah the way i learned it was uh, paula berman from pacific espresso taught me this when i first started was it's, we're not a, we're not an auto shop there's not a lot that we do that's like an auto shop we're a doctor and you track the machine like you would track a patient and it actually ended up after five years, we had documentation for several hundred machines where we was like, well, look, look, we're seeing this machine and we've got 10 machines having the same problem. That would give us the benefit of saying, hey, manufacturer, you've got boiler issues on these machines. Um, I moved over to your next slide. Yeah. Um, actually, I have a question for you, Marty, since just, well, you're talking about documentation. Um, do you have any tips or tricks or everyone else out there besides just taking pictures of the documentation process yeah absolutely um you know i mentioned that blue wire um throw some tags on on things um and not just wires throw tags on your your plumbing pieces that you take off um these tags are you know and i don't you don't have to buy expensive tags um tape um removable tape works just about as well. You want something that's going to stay on until you want to take it off. But one of the other tips, in addition to that, um, in cooperation with your photos, is to throw some tags on things with a little brief explanation of of what will help you put it back in the right spot. That's and Kurt, you probably have some other tips. Is there? Have you got? That's that's the two biggies on me: photograph and, and label. Um, I actually like grouping wires with zip ties and oh, I normally will hide the zip ties that have the uh, like little one inch or half inch piece that you can write on so mm -hmm. that's my favorite one actually so I can group like the groove out wire together and just group, group one group, group two so you know, it's, that's what it's I funny like. You, you say that I I do that with the group in the wires on the switches like say on a I'm picking on a lot of Zoko guys I love you um but you pull all the wires <laughs> off one switch um i i'll put a wire tie on that so yeah absolutely that's a great great idea hey, gentlemen let's move to the next slide we've got a lot of questions building up from yeah, my yeah. Viewers. oh that's awesome i love to keep we'll i want to get to the questions. so so i'll reiterate no stone unturned in other words don't send the machine out if you're refurbing it or if you're doing it for yourself do it for your own benefit don't assume something. Um, inspect everything. Um, we, got a, we got a good recommendation from Don Burquist. Um, take a Sharpie, write all changes inside the top panel. Oh, absolutely. That's a good one. Um, I got to put that one out there. Um, respect the value of the original design and materials. You know, those guys have spent sometimes, in some cases, millions of dollars on designing a piece of equipment and getting it out there and safe. And so, don't don't think that you are going to come along and redesign this thing um, uh, and be better. You might, but um, respect what, what work they've put into it. Uh, it's a big project, take it one piece at a time. You don't have to make the whole thing work in your head. Um, if you, pretty soon, you know, you just start building it and pretty soon you're done with it. Um, a uh, key thing is if if it is questionable, if you're worried about a fitting not working right, or it's not, you know, you're having to throw some Teflon tape. They don't use Teflon tape too awful much on flare fittings in the factory. If you're finding out you're having to do that, there's 
it probably needs replaced. Um, uh, I, and I never want to present anything without saying work safe, uh, stay clean. Um, uh, there's a whole a whole litany of, of safety tips when you're taking um, fittings off. If if the fitting is on a boiler and you have the ability to back that fitting up with another wrench so that you're not putting the force on the boiler and bending and cracking that, do that. Also, um, don't do arm, do wrist turns so that when that breaks loose, you're not. I, I have I have two weeks of. Uh, of surgery and rehab and stuff um, because I I didn't I didn't work safe so be safe out there. Um, next slide there. You got it. Um, again, every time you you go from the original design, you're assuming some liability risk. Um, that's not to say that you can't do some custom stuff. We do a lot of custom stuff. It's cool. It's what's really uh, exciting a lot of people out there. You know, the, the different um, uh, steam valves, different panels, lights, um, timers, you know, it's, it's all cool. Um, but um, the uh, safe, easy way to get into some mods, if you're doing some modifications is utilize some components that might already be on another machine. Um, uh, a good example is uh, La Marzocca Linea. They've got the, the three wrist turns or if you, you know, the baristas, they do that arm thing. Kurt's laughing, I see him smiling there. Um, uh, those can be changed out to GB5 style or uh, PB type valves. Um, so it's a tried and true valve. Um, we know it's been you know tested by others so those components and those changes would would be a nice safe um safer type of modification that you can do um so i got a, i got a question because i know i've done this in the past modifying heating elements putting in higher wattage heating elements what are your thoughts on that well again you're, you're stepping into um a, a zone where the if well i'll, I'll tell you this if if the machine was to have ever come out of the factory with that higher wattage because some machines that are out there you can you can order them in varying um, wattages and so you're totally safe without assuming any liability whatsoever of um, just staying within the the manufacturer specs of util utilizing that higher wattage that they would have used maybe on another machine that was special ordered that's fine um, but you are getting into um, uh, a world of I'm, I'm not saying you can't do it but anytime you you increase wattage you're going to increase amperage wire size needs to be a consideration you might have the wherewithal to be able to make that evaluation to know whether that wire size is large enough to handle that higher wattage, you may not be. Um, it's just a consideration that you might need to get into. Um, uh, it's the, those sort of things. So you're, you're assuming some some liability when you do right. that. I'm not saying you can't do it, but just be aware that you're 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 jumping into you being the designer at that point. Let me just state one thing with that: when updating the higher wattage. Uh, make sure the safety devices are correct for that higher watt development. Because oh, if absolutely. you're pulling too many watts on the wrong safety device, that will trip it instead of just the heat tripping the safety device. So yeah. just wanted yeah. to add that in real quick. Oh yeah, Michael Wilkins makes an interesting point is higher watt and cheating elements mean higher capacity contactors. Yeah, um, any anytime you're you're increasing that, anything within that circuit is is being subject to that modification. And so um, either you don't do it or you you really do need to do your research to see if you're you're still doing it it's safe um, one of the things I want to say is uh, stay within your abilities which kind of goes along with that if you don't know what wattages and what amperage what current are on different sizes maybe you shouldn't dive into that um, or or you need to get someone to go along with you um, so that they can go to court with you when something goes wrong. <laughs> um, 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 but always have a plan B. You know, if if something 
something didn't go according to plan, um, worst case scenario kind of things. And, and for that, I mean, uh, sometimes you may not plan on a refurb to change the, uh, the control brain, um, which is an expensive part. And if it hasn't reached, you know, every relay has a life expectancy of how many hundreds of thousands of times it's gonna click. And so um, you may kind of feel that we can do that, but you might get it rebuilt and find out it's not right. So have that plan B and be willing to, to go ahead and make it right. Um, in summary, why are you doing it? So make those evaluations. Um, evaluate the work, what, what's it going to take? Do you have the right resources? Um, balance the why with the cost. Um, don't discount the fact that it might be something sentimental that, that sometimes has a very high, high I, I put a ton, ton of work into a Senesso. It wasn't sentimentalized. I wanted it for a showpiece to show what we could do. Um, so it got new side panels, it got timers, it, it got it got custom. Um, could I ever get my money back out? No, no. But I, I did trade it for a two group flare. So um, uh, we come out on it. But it, the reason I was doing it was to showcase some things. Um, don't leave any parts out of the process. Um, and what I mean by that is don't leave parts off is not that. It means don't leave any parts unevaluated. You know, know what condition every component is so that you know whether that's going to last for the next five, 10 years or not. And above all, don't stress this. It's, it's all fun. Um, if, if it's stressing you out, um, reach out some resource. To people like Highland, Kurt, myself, um, get you over that hump, whatever that is. Uh, this this should be fun. Well, that's to a point. If you're a guild member, we offer the Slack channel, and the Slack oh, channel. Oh my God! If you need something or you have a question, we got 150 people that all of them. It's like a 30 second answer. But I mean, we've had some really good luck there. Absolutely, um, Marty. Um, let's get on to the questions. And Kurt, I'd like okay. to hear from you on some of these answers. Uh, I'm just going to read off what we've got, not necessarily in order. Mark Roby asks, what kind of warranties? Yeah, hi. I know we all know Mark. Mark Roby asks, what kind of uh, warranty is typical of a refurbished machine? Well, it, it's going to be different for everybody. Um, I, I can only explain to you what we do. It depends on the machine and it depends on our comfort level um, of the overall machine. Um, if we're really comfortable with it, I don't mind at all giving the same warranty that the factory would had going out, but that's about the most I would ever do. Um, I'd say on average, we're looking at six months and that's that's parts and labor. That's that's because if we've done it, we've touched everything, we're, we're pretty much responsible for it. So I, I can only, I can't tell everybody what to do. I can just tell you what we do. So it's at least six months and on certain machines, depending on our comfort level of and I have to incorporate where it's going, how far away it's going, um, uh, how old the machine really was when we started refurbing it. Um, but it's not uncommon at all to, to take it back to a factory warranty. Kurt, what do you offer when you do refurbs? Uh, the standard warranty for me on refurbs is six months, parts and labor. Okay. Uh, and like Marty said, tip that you have to if I'm talking to someone that's several hours away, I, I don't want to give a number. Um, I may actually tell them that I'll cover the machine, but they're going to have to cover maybe one way travel on any late on any of the warranty. Right. So, since they're so far away and most of the time they're okay with that. Uh, but the one thing I was going to mention is with heavy modifications. Customer comes to me and say, okay, refurb this machine. I say, okay, I'll refurb the machine. But if they have me do any heavy modification, I treat that more like a service call. The heavy modification may only get 30 days because that's what they're asking for, not what I'm comfortable with putting on that machine. So it, it's just- I can see that. Okay. Yeah. Don Burkwist actually really asks a really good question. Um, when should you not refer a machine? What, what are your benchmarks for going, I'm not touching this? The, on that initial evaluation, uh, if it doesn't meet your goal, um, like I said, if it's, uh, uh, if you can't achieve, uh, well, the low hanging fruit is if, if it physically can't be put back into working condition, you know, that's obvious. But if it's going to 
if the goal is to flip it, to sell it, if it exceeds that profitability, um, then that probably needs to be a parts machine. Um, right. That sort of thing. So that's it's during that initial evaluation um, and comparing cost versus um, value after the the fact. Great question. So Lisa Robbins has an interesting question. Um, where do you draw the line with replacement in terms of tubing and wiring? What is the process of cleaning tubing? And any tips on keeping parts and wiring organized while you do a refurb? That's actually a great question because that is that is very lost. Question. Yeah. Kurt, you wanna you wanna feel that one? Um, so there's a lot of times with tubing, I can cheat. I can braise new ends on my tubing and end it. The big key you have to know if you're gonna be doing custom tubing work is to get the heavier gauge tubing. You can't go out anywhere and buy some cheap tubing. Um, it's got to be refrigeration grade tubing. Is what I've found, but. Uh, it's just one of those parts, but typically tubing, uh, like you said, the cameras. So I take tons of pictures of tubing. Right. I have my schematics I typically find before I start a refurb. And then I just pull every bit of tubing off um, that's copper and it goes in descaler. And then any of the uh, silicone tubing or anything, all replaced and never leave any old silicone in. Uh, that's mine when it comes to the tubing. Um, wiring, if I look, I just look for any burn marks in the wires or any break in the insulation. Uh, and if I don't see anything. How about that, brittle? Yeah, I mean, well, brittle, brittles, the wiring needs to be malleable. You need to be able to bend it. Yeah, that's true. Well, and normally you'll see that with the uh, breaks in insulation. You'll see that kind of crackle look on the insulation. So that's the big thing. Yeah. I'm, Anything like that, the wire gets changed. Um, Lazar asks, um, what is the benchmark in terms of time, timing? How long do you consider a repair for like, a, for use an example of a full of a true group machine? What's your break even on that? Well, we just figure the, the cost if, if uh, we were billing a customer uh, for that shop time. Um, and that's gonna vary from shop to shop, anywhere from, you know, $55 an hour in some markets to well over $100 an hour. Um, uh, the more that you refurb and get into these uh, machines, you, you'll realize or have some kind of uh, idea of what it's going to take before you do it. Um, always, always tend to overestimate if you're estimating it because um, everything's going to take you longer than what you thought it was going to. Um, uh, to really get down and answer it. It just really depends on the machine. Um, now, of course, we don't work on them uh, day in and day out and every day. There's other machines that get in, but a refurb that comes to us uh, usually is in our building about two weeks. Okay. Michael Wilkins asks a good question. Um, and I have, I have another question. Um, Michael Wilkins is um, best chemicals on scaling and descaling brass and copper components. How far can we get on scale deposits? Because he, he makes a good point. I see a lot of beautiful machines, and I've seen this recently that just are just stunning on the outside, and the boiler is just a white rock. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, if you can get in the boiler and physically get in there um, and physically take it out, there's no chemical on the market that's going to take a anything more than a film out of out of things it'll it'll break things loose so you can physically get it out of there um but if you're if your acid's strong enough to take a quarter inch of scale off then it's too strong for everything so that's that's not an approach so you physically have to get things out um to to kind of expound on what kurt was saying one of the tricks that i do on tubing is we've got different um uh links of cable brake cable and clutch cable for bicycle and motorcycles um, mm -hmm. that we have that we utilize that to rotor rooter through these these tubes once we pull them out and then after we physically got as much of that calcium out of it and off of it and out of in there that we can then we go to the acid now as far as the acid that we use uh, there's a lot of acid baths that, that are on the market and there's some good ones Ernix makes some um, descaling and they tell you how much to uh, 
to use, and we've used them. Um, uh, a lot of the times we use just bulk, go to a food place and get citric acid. Um, there's a lot of a lot of people that like and dislike that. Um, we, it works works for us. And, and I use one teaspoon per liter. Um, and that's our ratio. And uh, everything goes in that after we've physically got as much stuff out as we can. And uh, it, it cleans it up inside and out. Mm -hmm. That works for us. Some good input from Mike Kahn. Um, ultrasonic baths work well for removing scalar from boilers. You can yeah. find a large enough ultrasonic bath. And then he makes an interesting point that I hadn't thought about on heating elements is heating elements may also change the heating characteristics and thus make, thus make the PID setting less optimal. And that's a point I hadn't thought about. Um, Lisa Robbins mm -hmm. asks a really good question. Um, how do you measure or estimate life expectancy of boards Relays and electrical electrical component of components aside from knowing the age of the machine. The solid state tough uh, or solid state components are really tough, but most of these boards also incorporate um, relays along with the solid state. Um, uh, what's really tough is that a lot of the solid state equipment will last a super long time because there's no moving components. The weak link in a lot of them are the the small relays um, that are that are incorporated uh, on the machines, and there is definitely a life expectancy on those. Um, uh, we've not done any great research. My my rule of thumb is if it's more than seven to eight years old, um, I'm leaning towards replacing that board, uh, even if it's functioning perfectly. Um, if it's a solid state and at, I know for a fact that there's no moving parts in it, no contacts to be corroding and, and building up a, a um, arc um, on those. Um, I might stretch that out a little bit further, but I would never not disclose that to someone that, hey, we've done everything but this. Um, I've, I've seen solid state machines out there uh, that's nothing but solid state, no relays, uh, you know, 12, 14 years old, working fine. Um, I don't think that's unusual to expect that. Yeah, I mean, I've seen boards. I mean, those boards, like I've seen autofill boards. I've got um, one of my customers has a lot of uh, um, two group lineas where we've never replaced the fill board. And they're 15 machines old, um, 15 years old. Um, Kurt, this question is <laughs> going to be for you. Um, okay. How do you manage customer expectations if they're, if they're working with a budget and giving pressure to keep costs low? on the refurb machine and that we, we've all experienced this uh, and this is from lisa robbins well so there's two things i'm looking at is it one of the machines i'm refurbing or is it the machine they're bringing to me so let's say if it's because i have um a pile of machines that i just kind of constantly turn over and i just get them to a certain point so like i like we're saying i get them to all the insides are acceptable they're i i'm comfortable with them um, but i actually don't worry about the outside until the customer approaches me at that point that's when i go what are you looking for are you looking for the base okay we'll leave the outsides as is you're buying, okay. you're buying a refurbished machine to be um well i mean they'll be polished don't don't get me wrong but i'm not replacing panels yet um but then then with that i'll go do you want it powder coated do you want brand new panels do you want it brought to a higher level but if they're bringing me the machine i have a base price i start with and i don't know if i would go so far as when they're saying it's they're on a budget if it's a refurb at that point or just a let's call it a rebuild that has limitations does that make sense? Right. To yeah. Makes sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so here's a big question. If they're on a budget, I'm not going to refer. Um, a refer does require commitment of a lot higher dollar value than just rebuilding it to make sure it's a good quality machine. I, I agree. So let's take this a, bit, a little bit bigger because I've done refer programs for larger organizations. Have any of you organized a refer program for a large company? And if so, how have you done it? What what are key points to doing it? A larger company. Well, the uh, largest one that we've done is we've we've done some 
component refurbs for Frankie um, uh, and things like that. But uh, it's the same thing. I mean, it's 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 a matter of disclosing exactly the process that you're going through, what you've done, documenting what what is done and what's what's not done. You know, if it's aesthetics that's left alone, you, it needs to be noted. Um, in other words, it's a it's a more of a communication thing um, with them so that you're doing what they're expecting and you're delivering that. Now, on a, on a larger scale, obviously the, the cost to them would, they would arm wrestle you to, uh, if you're doing 200 pieces of equipment rather than one, you know, by, by virtue of that, they're going to want you to, to do it per piece less. And you and you can, because instead of doing it one start to finish, you're doing several of them at one time. So you get everything in, in the acid bath. You get everything um, going. So your efficiencies are, are a lot better, too. Um, actually, Highland's computer is having an issue. So let me kind of look at... Uh, Actually, I kind of like this one. Have you ever scaling into a preventive maintenance contract with a customer? That's from Lisa Robbins. You're breaking up just a little bit. What were? Have you ever incorporated descaling into a preventative maintenance contract with the customer? But do you have that I, as like a yearly part of the PM? Um, I have not because here's here's my personal opinion on descaling. If if you, I would rather enter into a water treatment plan agreement with them uh, as far as that. I might would within that guarantee or imply some some efficiencies or effectiveness uh, of that water treatment so that if it did scale up um, that we would be a uh, partner with them to make that make that happen. Um, but as far as entering into a plan of preventive maintenance as a descaling, my personal feeling is the only machines that need to have a regiment of descaling are the ones with a thermal block, not a boiler tank. The thermal blocks are the little little blocks that that are heated up with a small um, capillary tube that goes through them that heats up your water for your espresso, um, not a boiler tank. Now the thermal blocks they need descaled because a little bit of film of scaling really messes them up. They, and the manufacturer has a descaling regimen. If that customer happens to have one of those, and some of the smaller super automatics are like that, we might would enter into that because the manufacturer is calling for that. But the vast majority of of the commercial machines that are out there, they don't have a thermal block design. And I'm not a, uh, a descale fan unless you're refurbing it. Uh, and I agree with you 100%. Um, typically, I try to make sure that their water is right. And a big part of that, you know, making sure I'd rather put them in a year contract for filtration or um, Absolutely. dealing with the RO system versus the descaling. So, but that's a different uh, Yeah, absolutely. Let's actually, this is from Don. Um, what is your time worth? When you're looking at these machines, do you look at your time as an in-shop tech or do you look at your time as a, a field tech? Because I know some places may actually value that tech time differently or value it differently. So you think of the refer time, even though it might be one of your field techs, you think of it as field time or shop time? Outstanding question, Don. Um, uh, I would, I would love to, and we probably will raise that because there's there's value in that evaluation time, um, more so than than shop, and it is kind of, I don't know, especially because we're we're more than likely dealing with a, a more complicated type machine rather than a drip brewer or, or something like that. If it's in for refurbing, it's probably a uh, an espresso machine, which by nature is um, would warrant a, a higher qualified tech even dealing with it. Um, but 
uh, I got to admit that our our shop shop time is is at a lower rate than our field time, and to date we probably we we don't differentiate that evaluation is right on the shop ticket time at that lower rate. Um, but I I think to to his point I I think that evaluation time is probably more valuable. I I wouldn't okay. argue that. Um, let me. Uh, now, I'm going to ask you this one because I have my opinion. When you get a from my comment, how do you refurb a machine which has already had some non-standard modifications? Um, we evaluate that non-standard modification, um, and I'll tell you honestly, what we typically do is unless it's a really good modification but if we're already questioning it we probably are going to try to get them to back to factory um, on on that we see um, a lot of the modifications are user modifications and or you know not at the quality that that we might would expect and so if it's not i try to talk them back at least back to factory specs um or or improve that now if it's a good work done good workmanlike manner nice quality components and then it'll hold its own that's good yeah good point now if you're doing the machine just to put it on the showroom to sell are you just going to go straight to oem is i think where the question was kind of leading to okay our uh our baseline uh, everything we base everything on on a machine, regardless of what, because most of the time we may not know the end result or the end game or where this machine's going to end up. We almost always shoot for factory. Let's get it back to factory. That's going to be X amount of dollars, and we can we can we've got enough history. We can nail that that X that estimate, um, and then if they want to start, if we find a buyer for it. And they want to start adding modifications or if they want to add powder coating and then those are add-ons those are, those are add-ons but uh, we we do absolutely try to get it back to baseline factory respect the design um, both in materials and design of that the factory brought it out with gentlemen i am back my apologies um hey. i'm going to say we go about 15 more minutes with questions we've still got some really good questions um awesome. caleb leach asks um, how do you get that delightful milk smell out of the boiler? <laughs> well, here's 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 the take on. Sometimes you can't. I, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but sometimes you cannot. Um, but here's we have been successful in some instances, depending on the design of that that boiler. Um, if the first thing you have to do is get as much organic material or sponge-like material out of that boiler. The stainless steel by itself won't hold the odor and smell near as much as what calcium or other components in there will, will hold it. Um, and so if you can open up the end of the boiler, if you know if there is access, physically clean, do, a, do an acid cleaning, you know, descale on that if you can. Um, if you can't, or don't want to take that time. Um, what we have been able to do, and it, I don't, I can't say that we've gotten rid of it 100%, but we we have been successful in get, getting it down to a tolerable level. Key is do it, do it as soon as you possibly can. So the, the organics of that milk that has been sucked up in there is uh, hasn't had as much time to to uh, get nasty. Um, now there's a, there's a but, cleaner that I know beer, that I know uh, brewmeisters use that reduces some of that. Have you heard of that? Uh -uh. No, but um, uh, what what we have, the chemical that we use is pure calf or you know, just your, your espresso cleaner um, and get it in there, heat it up and uh, uh, it's going to foam up in there, so get it spitting that foam out the steam valves and all of that assembly. But 
there's something about um, citric acid doesn't do it. It doesn't neutralize that smell, but there's something about the chemical makeup of the pure calf type cleaners, not necessarily that brand, but those cleaners that does tend to neutralize that, that smell. Okay. Now I'm going to jump in. And so I know typically if I have a skunked tank, milk tank, um, I'm actually a big for don't, don't do anything with it or it's bad at that point, because you're talking about the milk, starts growing bacteria internally and i have an issue with that so it, it's for i would say for the techs out there it's what's your comfort level on what you think you can actually how well you think you can clean it. um like marty's pretty knowledgeable guys out there in the industry and so his comfort is pretty high but for someone starting out i wouldn't recommend too much dealing with this kind of tank yeah, I, I, I agree. You know, you, you have to work within in your limits. Um, but like I said, to reiterate, it, you've got to physically get that as clean. And if you can get it down to stainless steel, that's that's your best. That's your best bet. Do you, um, do you replace that on that typically with those things? Um, yeah, typically. Yeah, because that's probably yeah. where most of your your buildup of any calcium buildup is going to be is on that element. That's what right. Most of it's going to be. I've got one that's like coated right now that I pulled it out and actually pulled out most of the buildup with it. Yeah. Uh, Mike, <laughs> uh, Mike, Mike Kahn has an interesting question. Um, how do you refurb a machine which already has some non-standard modifications on it? We've already went over that. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for taking care of me, Kurt. Um, and I, I um, let's see. Lisa Robbins um, asks a question. This is a good question because I know some techs will do this on site. Have you ever um, incorporated descaling into a PM contract with the customer? Yeah, we 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 actually did cover that too. Um, well, you guys are way ahead of me then. We yeah, we lean more towards water filtration than than a program unless unless the manufacturer calls for a, a regimental uh, descaling process. And in the case of a uh, a thermal block within the design of the uh, machine. Don Burke was actually asked an interesting question. What bacteria will survive in 230 <laughs> degrees that's, that's, in, in Yellowstone I, Park? But I, no. I, I knew someone would bring that up, Don, and Don is the perfect person to do that. And I, I was going to say that. I don't, I, I don't know. I'm not a... Uh, a professional in that realm and so I, I i tend not to get into those discussions but i don't my comfort level on drinking something that's been heated up to 250 degrees um is pretty pretty good um uh but that's that's a whole nother whole nother rabbit hole that um i don't know that we want to go down okay um, did you guys cover the question by Lisa Robbins on descaling steam valves? No. Okay. Lisa Robbins asks, do you typically remove all components and descale the steam valves on machines you refer? Yeah. We're going to take, the, uh, no. we're gonna take two more be, questions for the audience, by the way. Yeah, scales scale shouldn't be in the steam valve. What okay. you will have in a valve is milk products um, because what should be coming through the um the steam valve is steam which is is steam it's boiled water the scale or the minerals will not be carried in the steam it's pure water um, that's coming up in that so if you're getting a buildup in that that's going to be on the wand side of the valve seal and it's going to be milk products and if you're getting an extensive buildup there you need to purge your wands earlier in your drink process. In other words, as soon as you finish drink or make making that steamed pitcher, set that pitcher aside, purge your wand, wipe it off. Um, that'll keep that that vacuum process of the condensing steam from sucking those milk products up into the valve assembly. Okay. Um, what, I, I, had, I had a question about when do you decide that the machine is worth selling when you bring it in or if it's worth just display I mean, as, as a showpiece? 
Uh, I'd say how, how attached are you to it? Um, right. Anything that you have on display is, I don't care whether it's, whether it's a real fancy machine or not, people are going to like it, you know, they're going to like it. So there's value in having things on display. If you can show your rebuild abilities, if that's a, a word, um, <laughs> and showcasing, you know, the modifications or the powder coating or the whatever, on a machine, there's value in having that. What you don't want to do is get into the habit of spending too much money on the rebuilding and spending too much time on the rebuilding so that you don't recoup your money um, unless you know that's just what you want to do. Okay. Well, let me make a suggestion on this. Uh, like my showroom, Marzoko, the is my like Max and Reefer one is actually one with bad boil. So I didn't mind doing that one because it was like, well, it's got bad boilers, but it's here. I can show you powder coating capabilities, metal working capabilities. So there's a suggestion there. If you're going to keep it, use one of the machines that you determine is not worth or not valuable enough to sell. So I do that. It. Absolutely. Great idea. Yeah, that's the, that's the ones you don't have to worry about maybe the boilers but you still want to actually go through it and do all your cleaning just to make sure people see this is what you're capable of uh -huh. so i mean i sure. still descaled the boilers descaled the tubing put it all back together but i know i can't tell because there's a pinhole in the boiler so yeah. um so great, last great question idea. from it's a good idea kurt um last question from chad rich um can you fix plastic panels well <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's like I like I've tried Sugru. I've tried. I've tried. We I mean we've tried vacuum making a vacuum packing machine and molding it, and I've never been able to successfully mod a panel exactly the way that it looks. So, what have you guys done? Um, it really kind of depends on the the damage that's done to the panel, where it's at, the physical structure. Um, my go-to is if that panel is available, it's a plastic panel. If it's available from the manufacturer, let's let's get a new panel on there. Um, just partly, it, it's cracked partly. These machines get hot, um, and so I would say a lot of the damage that we see is due to the fact that they're they're getting hot, um, and it it just really makes that panel brittle. So if you fix that crack, um, you know, two months later it's cracked elsewhere. Right. Don Burquist suggests plastic epoxy, by the way. Well, uh, let me I mean, make a suggestion. Like Marty was saying, if you can replace it, do it. And if they're attached, if your customer is attached enough to that machine, um, suggest maybe getting custom wood panels. Or um, I've actually seen people go to uh, metal shops and have them bend a similar si type panel. I mean, you're talking money, but once again, how attached are they to the machine? Are you sure. guys familiar oh. with the old one group Winchesters? The 110s? No. I have, yeah. somebody, who has, I have somebody here who has 20 in the field. And we ended up just setting him up with a metal shop and he just makes the panels for him. Nice. Yeah. Um, gentlemen, we're going to wrap it up. I'm going to each give you a final second to say something, then I'll close it out. Marty, what do you got? Again, I just, you know, for you guys to put this on. Uh, and it, it goes to show the, the need out there with the great questions that, that were asked. I mean, if, if we were to sit here and nobody got involved, no one got on and no one asked any questions, it would tell me that, hey, you know what, we're, we're having fun, but there's not a need out there. Obviously, there's a need out there to share this information. Um, and, uh, and we don't have all the answers. We're learning along the way, too. So um, I guess I just, I just want to take an opportunity to thank Thank you guys to uh, for taking the time and to uh, put this together. Um, this is awesome. Awesome for the industry. Awesome for newbies. Awesome for the people that's been doing it for 30 years. You know, it's Thank great. You. Kurt, you? Um, first thing I just actually want to say is stay safe, everyone. Stay safe. Um, but yes, thank you, as Marty said, for helping the industry. Um, and Thank you for trying to represent coffee technicians. And 
make sure everyone's aware that we are an industry and we are here. So thank you, everyone. So this these the Ask the Expert series was designed by the membership content group, which Kurt and Benedict is a key part of. And we've designed these yeah. as you watch these, and Marty is gonna be soon if you'll let the hustle him. Um, and we design these not just for industry experts, but they're also for baristas. We do a big mix. This is the last episode in season one. This was an experiment. We will be doing seasons throughout next year, so we'll be continuing. If there's anything that you'd like to see, I put my email, email on the messages. Um, feel free to email me out. Also, uh, if you have questions for Marty or Kurt, shoot me an email and I'll get it over to you. Other than that, it's been a real great experience with you guys this last eight, this, this last eight episodes. I'm looking forward to the next 10 episodes and have a great holiday and stay safe. Thanks, you guys. Be safe, everyone.